a cock of an assassino. Frida Danaja, Cosi Poano. Mom Jatabe Pomotin, I see a quantity. Yamimara, Dinkin, Bebe. Mom Jatabe Pomotin, I see a quantity. Yamimara, Dinkin, Bebe. Praise the Lord. Christ in you. We thank God for our lives and we thank God for <clears throat> how far he has brought us. We want to show appreciation to the director and the neck, the opportunity they've granted us. I'm coming to look at the Savior, continuing with the doctrines. And before I do that, I want to start by telling a story. There were two kings, very well much to do. They had much money, much influence in their vicinities. And it did happen that they had two sons. These two separate kings apparently had two sons. The sons, because of the riches of their parents, decided to live anyhow. And so it was in the days that we talk about the evil forest and other things. So uh, one day, nobody knew what happened. These two children of the royals decided to go into the evil forest, and they did. Because no one can advise them and no one can say anything to them, they just left and they went. There... The kings had the information that their sons have entered into the evil forest. The options left for the kings were to decide to see as what will constitute them bringing their children back. The first king came out with a plan. As Elder Marissian was helping us to know how to strategically plan holistic programs. And so the kings sat down, thought through it, and write a lot of directions for the son. The thing was like, if the king also goes there, he may end up losing the throne. And so the king decided that he was going to write, give the instructions, and then send it. So that when the child gets to know the instructions, the child will follow the instructions and come back home. The instruction got to the child all right, but the child couldn't follow the instruction and come. And then the second king also got to know the information. But the second king also sat down, thought through it, planned, and then he decided that even if it is going to cost me my throne, I am going to go there for my son. My son is more important to me. And so the king decided and then left, went to the forest, and all that he said was that, I know my son is rebellious. If he had listened to me, he wouldn't have been there. Now that he has gotten there, I have the privilege of going to bring him back. This is the story of our salvation. Our father left everything in the heavens simply to come for us. And this is the story we share. This is the joy we have. When Pastor Seth was talking this afternoon, he was saying that sin deformed us. Sin defaced us. But there was a clause. And the clause was that we were redeemable. Hallelujah. It is this same redeemable that has granted us the opportunity to talk about the Savior as our tenant. Can we all be on our feet now? If it will be projected for us, we want to do the affirmations together. Okay, if we are not having it, then you will do this to help me. I say it, you say it after me. It's very, very important. All that I'm going to share is based on this affirmation. We believe that man needs a savior. Uh, let there be vacuum. Uh, say it with some vim. We believe that man needs a savior. This need has been met in the person of Jesus Christ. 
for the following reasons. His deity, virgin birth, sinless life, atoning death, resurrection and ascension. Also his abiding intercession. And second coming to judge the living and the dead. Matthew 1, 21. John 4, 42. Ephesians 5, 23. Philippians 2, 6 to 11. Amen. Let's kindly take our seats. We'll read the Philippians 2, 6 to 11. If anyone has opened that, the person can do me the honor by coming to read Philippians chapter 2, the verse 6 to 11. This is going to form the basis of our discussion. Bless you, brother. Who being in the form of God thought it's not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and he became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. Verse 9. Wherefore God also had highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Verse 11. And that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Verse Amen. Amen. God bless you. Can you kindly stand? Let's do this together. I want you to go around. Look for people you don't know, not those that you know. And then look straight into their eyes. You are communicating. And you are telling them that Jesus is Lord. Say it as if you mean it. And say it well. And after saying it, after saying it to three people, then you come and sit down. Uh -huh. If you finish, you sit down. Yeah, in order for you not to be so tired. If you know how to sing this song, join me and let's sing it together. To me, I did yeah. Oh, Martin, Quan, or your own one when
problem of man was sin. And glory to God that he had a plan. And so even in Jesus Christ before coming onto this earth, the final light in the man's depraved nature was this. The loss of man was not a total loss of image. The image of God in man was defaced, not deformed. Man still retained the image of God in their personalities. They still had a capacity for God, but no way of fully realizing it. John 14, 6. And so because of this, we say that our salvation has been met in Jesus Christ because of his deity. And so if you look at the process, it is basically about a three-way thing. As deputy was saying this morning about the tripod stand. We have the pre-existence of Jesus Christ. We have his life on earth. And then we have, after he had completed his work on earth, what he is currently doing. And so in relation to the deity, John 1 verse 1 talks about his deity. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. John 20, 28, Romans 9 verse 5, Philippians 2, 6, Titus 2, 13, 1 John 5, 20. All talks about the deity of Jesus Christ. We also have the divine names, which also attest that Jesus Christ had already been prepared for the salvation of mankind. Isaiah 9, 6, Isaiah 43, Jeremiah 23, 5 to 6, and then Joel 2, 23. Then the divine attributes, which our uh, pastor obey and then director handled. And then divine works and then divine honor. All these things was in the deity of Jesus Christ, which qualified him to come and save man. In it, talking about the virgin birth comes into mind what we call Jesus' incarnation. And this, according to theologians, is a controversy. And there has been a lot of heresies in relation to this incarnation. We have those that are the Ebionites. They have their stand. We have those that are the Arianism, which Jehovah Witnesses are now holding on to, which I will touch briefly on. And then we have a lot. We have the Nestorians and then other people who spoke on the divinity of Jesus Christ. Some went ahead by denouncing that Jesus was not a pre-existent one. Jesus Though he came in the flesh, was not in the beginning. And that is the Arianism stand. This theory was propounded by one called Iris. And then according to him, he says that the divinity of Jesus Christ is less than the divinity of the Father. And so per Iris' stand, he says that we can't say that Jesus existed in the beginning. But glory to God. We had people that when these heresies came, they were able to put themselves together, set through scripture, and then came with a defense to the gospel. And one of them was what we called the hypostatic union. Can we all say it together? Hypostatic union. The hypostatic union talks about the fact that Jesus Christ was 100% man and 100% God. Nothing took away his divinity whether on the cross or wherever he lived on earth, his divinity was equal to the divinity of the Father. And so per the hypostatic union, as we have seen in scripture, Jesus Christ was revealed as the second person of the Trinity. And per the Trinity, he came in the flesh and he came for a purpose, he came for a reason. His 100% being God, his 100% being man was the only thing that could save man from the condition man found himself. The original sin that man found himself, it was only God that could deliver man. And glory be to God that this was met in the person of Jesus Christ. I pray that the church will understand this. I've been saying that one challenge we have as a church, and director touched on it a little this afternoon. One challenge we have at, as a church is this. If we don't train ourselves to understand these doctrines we are talking about, and we don't hold on to them, and we ourselves become confused in our mind. The possibility of we not continuing to the end is high. But I pray that for you, 
you will constantly understand this doctrine. You, 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 you are going to give yourself to the studies of this doctrine and then understand them. It is not just enough reading about it. It is not just enough having mental knowledge about it. It is enough when you test the scriptures and then it proves right in your life. So that you can have a testimony. Based on the testimony, it will not be my pastor said. It will not be my church said. But it will be that I have encountered him. And because I have encountered him, I have a personal testimony to share. And because of this, I believe that Jesus is the son of God. May God grant us testimonies. Living testimonies that will let us stand. Living testimonies that will not let us be weak in the face of opposition and in the face of contradicting truth. Jesus is only the way because he was fully man and fully God. Why did he come? Reasons for the incarnation. Incarnation simply means to come in the flesh. And the come there means flesh, coming in the flesh. Divinity coming into flesh or in humanity. And so the first one is to confirm the promises of salvation made to the patriarchs. So many promises were made to the patriarchs. The early people who the Lord worked with, like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, so many promises were made to them. And so to fulfill the promise, Jesus came. Genesis 3, 15 talks about the seed of the woman bruising the head of the serpent. Genesis 22, 18 Isaiah 7, 14, 9, 6 to 9, on and on. Then the second reason why Jesus came is to destroy the works of the devil and his kingdom. And that is why Jesus came. So he came to fulfill a promise. Number two, he came to destroy the kingdom of the devil. The third reason is to provide a perfect sacrifice to God. And in all these things that I'm sharing, I will want you to let these things happen in your life. You will need the practicality of this. And that is the best way you will stand by the doctrine of Christ. I pray God will grant you understanding into this one too. It continues to talk about still reasons why Jesus came. Yes, Jesus is humanity. He was born of a woman. A woman gave birth to him. Uh, in this, this one, they call it uh, Theodicus. Uh, Theodicus. It simply means that Jesus was born by a woman. And so we say Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ. He had a human development. That is what Luke chapter 252 talks about. He studied the scriptures. He had a body. Other reasons for Jesus being the only savior include his sinless life. You can correct. We have John 8, 46, Hebrews 4, 15, 1 Peter 2, 22, not 29. So 1 Peter 2, 22. And then his atoning death. All these were reasons why Jesus Christ was qualified to be our Savior. Can we go to the next slide, please? Jesus' death and his barrier. This is also a controversy. Many people want us to understand. That is why they are saying that the Bible itself has a challenge. They want to take this part. I remember just recently, uh, a brother was telling me that some part of the Bible will have to be rewritten because certain things in the Bible it's not true. And one of the things he was standing on was that Jesus didn't die. Jesus went to stay in India. He married Mary Magdalene and stayed there and then gave birth. And because the disciples couldn't trace him, they said that he died and they didn't find him. This is a lie from the pit of hell. Is it at times you will, you will want to give a defense to the faith. But when people seem to be proving so difficult, pray for them and leave them. I pray you will understand this one too. So that you will not have anything to do with baseless arguments. And so the Bible tells us that, please can I get that same slide? The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ tasted death for every man. The death that he tasted for every man is in three parts. First, we had a spiritual death. He experienced spiritual death when he was made sin. And that is what 2 Corinthians 5.21 talks about. The second one is the physical death. He experienced the agony of physical death when he suffered the agony of a crucified man and died. Then the third one, when he was crucified and then died. Then the next one, the resurrection. Jesus was raised bodily by God. Jesus was raised for our justification. Romans 4.25 talks about that. Jesus was raised to be a living savior for all those who believe. Romans 5 verse 8. And then his ascension. Jesus was raised and went back to heaven. 
this morning, I think we spoke a little about this. Director was touching on that, so I won't waste so much time. And then he intercedes daily for the sin. This is his current work. So Jesus is in heaven, and he is interceding for us daily so that we can complete the work that has been given to us. And then finally, his second coming. We believe that Jesus Christ, after he has done all these things, according to the affirmation we made, Jesus is going to come again. That is the joy and the hope of every believer. If Jesus died and came back to life, we are believing that when we also die, we will come back to life. And so don't worry. All those relatives of ours, I lost my father four years ago. I believe that because he trusted in Jesus and believed in Jesus, a day is coming I'm going to see him face to face. A day is coming we are going to celebrate to the Lord. I also believe that if you are also able to walk in the ways of God, you are able to accept Jesus Christ for who he is, surely. If the second coming doesn't meet you and you pass on, the Bible says that to die is to be present with the Lord. If the second coming comes, we are all going to resurrect again. To conclude this, Ephesians chapter 6, I'll conclude with Ephesians chapter 6. And I'll read briefly in Ephesians chapter 6. And after that, I will hand over the microphone. I want to read from the Message Bible. Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 14 to 17. Let me start from 13. It says, be prepared. You are up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get. Every weapon God has issued so that when it is all over, so that when all this battle is over, so that when life is over, the shouting is going to be at the feet of Jesus Christ. It says, truth, righteousness, peace, faith. And then listen to the verse 17. And it says, and salvation are more than mere words. Salvation are more than mere words. If you pick it in the NIV or the King James, it says that take on the helmet of salvation. And the message Bible is saying that salvation is more than mere words. He continues to say that learn how to apply them. Learn how to apply your salvation because the onslaught of the enemy and the battle you are going to be faced with will all be in your mind. All the struggles you are going to be faced with will all be in your mind and it will all be based on the fact that you accept that in your frailty, you have a savior. It says that you will need them throughout your life. God's word is an indispensable weapon and that is who Jesus is. Our savior cannot be neglected for us to stand in this end time. I pray that as we end and other speakers take us through who the Lord has made us, you'll be settled in your mind that there are no more ways to heaven with the exception of Jesus Christ because he emphatically said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. There is no truth apart from the Savior. God bless us all. Amen. God bless you. Yeah, time for questions. If you have any question concerning the doctrine of the Savior, you can come. Yes. Ah, come. Okay. Thank you, Daddy, so much. Please, I have a friend who met a group of pensioner guys and said that there's no need for Christians to pray for forgiveness of sins. And then he back it with these quotations. Hebrews chapter 10, the verse 14 to 18. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all times those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying... This is the covenant that I will make with my people. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he added, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of this, there is no longer any offering for sin. So the question is, should Christian pray for forgiveness of sins? All right. 
please, also my question is, we have other people who are not Christians, like the pessimists and the agonists and all those people who are saying that God is not, God has his own way of communicating to man or having a relationship with man. And so we shouldn't tag uh, Jesus Christ as being the only way because there can be so many ways. Like the Hindus and the staff, they all have their beliefs. And so with these people, when you meet them, Sometimes with apologetics, but they would never understand. And so, Daddy, how do we go about that? And please, talking about Jesus Christ, why, do we some, why does the Bible sometimes refer to him as the Son of Man? Is it because he was born of Mary? Praise the Lord. So I would like to handle the second question. That says that people of varied religions believe that there are different ways that we can go to heaven. Yes, we will not fight them for believing in that. But we are not them. We are Christians. And you see, we have one source material, which is the Bible. Sometimes when Christians want to prove for other religions, I have a worry. So if anybody asks you, you are a believer... And your manual is the word of God. In the word of God, the word says that for anybody to make it to heaven, Jesus is the only way. You see, don't try to speak for others. Speak for yourself. Hallelujah. And I believe that once we do that, you see, let's arm ourselves with the word of God. And from the word of God, we project ourselves. Let us not speak for other people, but let's speak with the word of God. Amen. Back to pastor's presentation. Now, scripture makes us understand that God has revealed himself even in nature. So nature itself tells us that who God is. So it is men because of the stubbornness of their hearts that have decided not to accept all the proof that God has given us that he does exist. And then let me tell you, apologetics is telling people what you believe, why you believe it, and why you are able to communicate it. Don't let them determine for you your opinion about God. Thank you very much. Even to add to that, um, John 14, 6, this is a very common quotation. B, it says that no one comes to the Father except through me. Mm -hmm. So if you think you want to go to God, through any other means, apart from Jesus, you are wrong. This, this is basic, basic truth. All right, um, on the last question, that is why we refer to Jesus Christ as son of man, and sometimes, and a son of God. Jesus Christ allowed the title son of man to be used on him when he came to the world, because when he came here, he was fully God, like we've said, and then again, he was fully man. Amen. Some traits he showed proved the fact that he was God. Uh -huh. His birth, his sinless life, his precarious death, um, his resurrection from the dead, his ascension up into the skies proved the fact that he was God. These are supernatural happenings. And then again, when he came, he lived his life as man. At a stage, he got angry. At a point, he, he wept. You know, at a point, he was hungry. So he was man. So he was son of God or the son of man. Amen. Thank you. In relation to the first question, where the brother was saying that uh, once we have been forgiven of our sins, we shouldn't pray again for the forgiveness of sins. I, I'm sure that was the question. If this morning we followed uh, Pastor first presentation, he says that whatever that has been written in Scripture, we should first take it literally. And we shouldn't try to read meanings. You see, the problem of uh, uh, the church at the time that writing is gospel, and then the book of John, was the Gnostics. The Gnostics claimed that they had special revelation. And so before anybody can go to God, unless the person come to them, what does the Bible say in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9? 
It says, if we confess our sins, he is, why are we trying to uh, meander our way and then make it so difficult? You see, I have two definitions to this that normally when people ask me, I tell them. We have remission of sin. Remission of sin is not given to the believer in Christ. Listen to me carefully. The remission of sin is when somebody doesn't know Jesus Christ. He doesn't, that person doesn't need forgiveness. That person is seen to be with the original sin. And what is the original sin? Not knowing Jesus as the savior of the world. And so such a person who is now coming after the gospel has been ministered and the Holy Spirit has convicted the person, the person needs remission of sin. That is sin. After the person has received the remission of sin, as long as he is in this flesh, John still writing said that there are some sins that lead to death. Some sins don't lead to death. What was he talking about? And so he says that for sins that lead to death, I'm not saying that pray about that one. He was talking about the sin that people will refuse to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and personal Savior. That is an unpardonable sin. It can be forgiven, either in this life or in the life to come. But when we talk about sins, he says that certain sins we should pray about them. For that one, the Lord will have mercy. So if the Apostle John was saying, pray for the forgiveness of sin, who am I to say that don't pray for the forgiveness of sin? May God grant us grace. And so understand that we have that responsibility. As if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. To the believer in Christ, he needs forgiveness of sins. And that doesn't also encourage you because First John chapter 3 also tells you that anyone that has seen Christ will not live in sin. And that is our standard. Our standard is Jesus Christ. May grace abound for all of us. Put your hands together. We thank God. Then also, to add to what um, Pastor Fifi said concerning Jesus being the Son of Man, anytime the scripture uses that statement, then it means they want to link Jesus to the lineage of David. I hope you understand. Uh, because prophetically, it was prophesied that Jesus will be from the lineage of David. So anytime they use it, then they want to link him to the lineage of David. We thank God so much for bringing us to the end of this afternoon's session. Give it to me, a quack of a assassino. Frido Danaja, Kosi Poano. Mom Jatabe Pomotin, I see a quanti. Yami Mara, Dinkin, Pepa. Mom Jatabe Pomotin, I see a quanti.